Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Brett Sanders. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining me tonight. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I think I'll get, get right into it. Um, photograph here of uh, Los Angeles River. It's captured by um, someone who actually photographs the Los Angeles River for, um, for the city and county of LA. His name is Kevin Brake, and I'll feature a few of his photographs in my presentation tonight. Um, he's sort of uh, an artist with just a, a fascination of the river and the waves and so forth that, that you see in the river. I'd like to start by acknowledging a diverse group of collaborators that you know, contributed to this research. So I've been fortunate to work at UC Irvine with um, people in obviously the School of Engineering, but also the School of Social Ecology and the School of Physical Sciences and bring together you know, diverse perspectives around this important issue of flooding. So I've listed many of those people here today. Um, I've also listed, um, listed collaborators at the University of Miami and University of California Riverside and University of California San Diego who've contributed. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge some of the funding agencies that have made this work happen. So up here in the right-hand corner, I have National Science Foundation, which has been the primary funder of this particular research. But we've also had collaborations with California State Parks, where we've been sort of monitoring how the coast is changing and some of the impacts across California of flooding and erosion. Uh, recently, we've um, attracted funding from the National Science Foundation to kind of think, I mean, from NASA, to think about how we can use different types of satellite-based platforms to track what's happening along our coasts, how the coasts are changing, um, how sediment's moving. And we've also had funding from NOAA to study specifically how sediment is being moved around the coast and the ways in which the movement of sediment is affecting our vulnerability um, to flooding. And lastly, I'd like to highlight um, a partner, which is the Crystal Cove Conservancy, where we try to take our research and work with them to make sure that research is accessible to high schools. And so we train both high school students and high school teachers about coastal dynamics. We, and we, we were able to bring students from across Southern California, from many Title I schools, out to the beach and learn firsthand about the force of water. You can stand in the surf and feel waves running um, you know, over your feet. You can feel the force of the water. You can watch the way sediment moves with the water. And that's a really um, fabulous way to introduce um, high school students to coastal processes and, and flooding and erosion problems. So this is a photograph of Houston during Hurricane Harvey. And it, it's a photograph that unfortunately we're seeing more and more frequently these really um, severe flooding disasters that are happening seemingly over and over again in our major cities. We've had um, basically events like going back to Katrina, obviously Harvey. This past year we had the severe flooding with Ida. And the US is actually leading the world when it comes to severe, especially costly flooding disasters. Um, if you look at the costs of our flooding disasters, in the history of the world, the, among the top 10 most costly disasters that we've had, six of them have occurred, the top six have all occurred in the United States. So unfortunately, we have the distinction of leading the world in these really costly, um, damaging um, disasters. And one of the things that we're trying to focus in on now is the, is the impact on cities. So cities seem to be especially off guard by this growing incidence of disasters. And um, you know, from Houston to New York to New Orleans, you know, flooding seems to be coming in at levels far beyond anyone could have, what, what anyone could have imagined. And it's um, you know, clearly wreaked a lot of um, impact on, on those communities. Um, in addition to the cost, flooding is deadly. Um, you know, people um, inundated by flood water um, risk their lives and um, for decades, in fact, we are seeing reductions in the, in the fatalities from flooding across the US. And those reductions in flooding fatalities were coming with the development of early warning systems. So our weather forecasting systems and you know, getting information out to communities and, and, and public works departments that would head out and, and sort of um, try to inform the residents about hazards. All those activities were helping to reduce the number of fatalities from flooding disasters. But um, Ida was especially um, fatal event, um, most recently this past year, so we're well over 100 people 
you know, died as a consequence of that event. And a lot of times they're dying because they may be old, you know, um, elderly, unable to leave their home. They may have medical needs that cannot be met outside their home. They may not have the mobility to leave their home. And so they end up um, being trapped. And um, that was the, certainly what we saw with Ida, as many um, elderly and, and people with health care um, challenges were unable to um, find safety during a flood. Another issue is that flooding is disproportionately impacting um, disadvantaged communities and, and people of color. So we're seeing that the impacts of flooding aren't falling evenly across the U.S., but they're often falling on, on people who, um, who are disadvantaged and um, vulnerable in, in ways that make the impacts um, even more acute. And the other aspect of flooding that we're following is that some communities are recovering. You can look across the U.S., see communities where floods happen, resources come in after the fact, people recover, the, the, the community members um, often have jobs where they can, say, work remotely or take some time off or get vacation, and they might have insurance that helps them you know, rent a hotel for a few months while some repairs are taking place at their home. Some people turn off better off after a flood. You might have insurance that allows you to remodel your properties and reinvest in your properties, build equity in your property, and you can end up better off from a flood um, under some circumstances. But there's another segment of the, of the U.S. which is finding it um, really difficult to recover from floods. Floods come, it's not just that your home is impacted, but your job is impacted. You don't have a job anymore. Your home has been, you're displaced, you spend all your time trying to find a place to live, and while you're trying to find a place to live, you're not working, you're not making income, and you're not um, able to pay the bills. So floods are, and then um, also these um, flooding events are impacting people's health, long-term health, mental health challenges, in addition to physical health challenges. So, so these, these sort of compounding challenges are, are differentially impacting communities across the U.S. Some are recovering, resources are flowing in, other communities are, are sort of spiraling downwards and finding... Um, their communities are not bouncing back. Another big issue with floods is that they are um, really impactful on global supply chains. So, so um, transportation infrastructure is almost invariably located near water. Water is where we can bring in big ships to load containers, move goods. All of our rail lines need to get down into those ports. And, um, and when floods come and disrupt all that infrastructure, we find that our, our economy you know, um, has all sorts of challenges, and suppliers can't meet their, their needs, um, um, goods aren't delivered, and there's, there's these um, major sort of uh, economic disruptions around the world. So we're kind of coming into a pretty serious flooding crisis. These flooding disasters are becoming more frequent. Cities seem to be especially vulnerable and underprepared. Um, the impacts of floods aren't being spread evenly uh, across communities. Some are doing, um, coming, bouncing back, others are spiraling downwards. Um, recovery can be prolonged and incomplete, and so sort of there's global um, economic ramifications of these flooding events. So we can ask, what's driving these trends? Um, the number one factor driving these um, trends has been development in high hazard areas. There was a paper that just came out this year pointing out that like since the 1980s, like the amount of development in floodplains around the world has just magnified. More and more, you know, we, we, more and more people around the world are moving into cities. Cities are growing. Cities are looking for places to sort of house people. Look at Southern California today. We have California as a whole, the U.S. as a whole, has a housing crisis, trying to find you know, places for people to, to, to live. And so that's pressuring communities to build in areas that we didn't build on before. Well, why didn't we build there before? Well, we didn't build there before because there's some drawbacks to building there. It's not the safest place to build. It might be vulnerable to flooding. It may have other challenges. Um, but, but what's happened is we've, we've built more and more in, in harm's way. Um, second thing, we've marginalized a lot of the natural buffers that protect us from flooding. Examples include forests, you know, um, grasslands, um, along the coast, wetlands, and um, natural systems that act as buffers against these big storm events. You know, we watched these um, hurricanes roll into Florida, uh, Ian, in, in Fort Myers, and the devastation that was struck. 
Um, and a lot of those coastal areas are, are areas that were built out over recent decades and previously would have been covered in, in some plants and some marshlands and some grasslands and some habitats that could have buffered the impacts of the storm before they hit some of the more inland communities. But we've, we've sort of um, built out into those buffers. And so not only are we in harm's way, but we've removed the, those sort of buffers that would have um, offered us some protection against these extreme events. Another issue is that our, our major infrastructure is aging and, um, and um, under-maintained. So, you know, the U.S. grew tremendously after World War II. A lot of infrastructure was built out. And a lot of the infrastructure is kind of reaching the end of its surface life. It's aging, it needs to be replaced. And so that's, that's one of the drivers. Um, inequ inadequate risk mapping. We haven't, we haven't accurately mapped out the areas of, of the U.S. that are at risk. And when, there's, when you're not aware of a, a problem, you have no ability to manage it. So low awareness is a problem. Clearly, the compounding social factors are contributing, as I mentioned before. Um, government is complex and, and challenging to sort of streamline and, and work efficiently. And so some of the challenges of all the different levels of government we have to deal with flooding, from federal to state to local and all the coordination that has to take place, it's, 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 it's not always easy for our government to kind of you know, um, dial in the way it operates to, to address these types of challenges. And lastly on the list, I'll mention climate change. And I purposely put it on the last of the list because I think all too often we're putting that at the top of the list. And it is, in my mind, on the top of the list for the future. We have to be very concerned about a changing climate and changes in extreme weather. But I think a lot of the challenges we, you know, we face today are challenges due to the land use change. The fact is that we've built into these really high hazard areas and that's been a, um, one of the most important drivers and we shouldn't overlook the, the things that we've done um, in our own communities to make ourselves more vulnerable. So, so I'm coming at this thinking about the opportunity to do better, to um, use technologies to help us um, think critically about what's at risks, to involve community groups and stakeholders in thinking about what's at risk and think about how we can manage it. So we work on these um, detailed models of, of flooding that are now possible to simulate flooding across entire metropolitan regions. This is a snapshot of a part of the Los Angeles metro area where there's a drainage channel. The pink is a deep water. It's just a, a, a major drainage channel. The, the color gradation here we developed through a co-production process here in California where we have the lightest blue is, is water that's ankle depth ankle to knee depth, knee to waist deep, waist to head deep, and overhead depths of water. So with this scale, anyone can intuitively see for a particular scenario, and this, is, this happens to be a 1% a annual chance scenario, so it's the kind of flooding that on any given year has a 1% chance of happening. Um, and it's a, it's a standard we commonly use for engineering design. But this, uh, this visualization allows anyone in a community to immediately grasp the possibility of a flood what it, you know, where it might happen, um, who could be impacted, what could be impacted. And then it allows for us to sort of think about what we can do about it. With simulation technology, we can say, well, what if we invest in, you know, more green infrastructure? How would that change the outcome of a future flood? What if we invested in, um, you know, raising levees? That's what we've done in the past. Um, we could look at that again. Um, we, what about widening channels? Or, um, so there's different options we could think through. And then um, and use tools like this to sort of study uh, the distribution of of, um, of outcomes. What we've had in the past has been these large these sort of FEMA flood maps. It's been really the only tool we've had to kind of understand the areas of the U.S. that are at risk. And what's important to recognize about FEMA maps is that they weren't designed to help communities be more prepared against flooding. They were designed to administer an insurance program. So the insurance program was set up by the government to provide some subsidized insurance to properties that fell within the 100-year flood zone and couldn't afford insurance at actuarial rates. So the federal government says we need to incentivize more people to have insurance so that the U.S. as a whole doesn't have to bail out you know, every community that floods all across the U.S., and so they set up the, the National Flood Insurance Program and created um, flood maps that helped communities see areas at risk. Um, 
but they're not necessarily intuitive visualizations that help you appreciate the way water moves and, and visualize how an event might happen. Um, it's sort of a binary, you're in, you're out. And, it, and we also had other drawbacks from FEMA maps. They take a long time to update. And um, they're not always reflective of, 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 of um, say, climate change and other factors. So with this as sort of a backdrop, I'd like to share with you kind of some research questions that have interested us and we've been looking at for the last couple of years. Um, the first is a really simple question. How many people are at risk? <laughs> but we know the FEMA maps aren't very good. What we really don't know, especially in cities, what is the scale of this risk? And then the complementary question to that is, who is at risk? Most of the flood mapping we've done and most has been has been done to think about how, what kind of infrastructure we invest in. And a lot of the thinking about infrastructure has been guided by what kinds of economic benefits we want to see from that infrastructure. But when we focus too much on the economic benefits, we overlook the human aspects. What kind of communities do we want? What kinds of an ecosystem benefits do we want? And so, and so um, this question of who is exposed is one that has not been looked at extensively um, and then the last question is, you know, how do we take, um, you know, how can we improve infrastructure planning and community assistance before, during, and after flooding disasters? So how can these simulation tools really help governments at many different levels and help community groups at different levels to, um, to be better prepared and more, more resilient and um, um, better poised to, to recover from floods? So to answer this question, we focused on Los Angeles. I found this, this photo of, of Los Angeles that really, I think, to me, captured it nicely. You've got the palm trees, you've got people moving, you've got freeway traffic, you've got some glitzy skyscrapers. Um, and that's kind of, many, in, in, to many people, like the, the picture of Los Angeles that, that resonates with them. And it's probably, flooding is probably the last thing you might think about when it comes to, to Los Angeles, right? So you think about a lot of things, maybe not flooding. And, and in some sense, that's part of the challenge Los Angeles faces in trying to manage flood risk because nobody thinks about it. And it's real. <laughs> this is um, a photograph of the Los Angeles River after the 1938 flood that, that destroyed um, one of the railroad bridges and caused some wide, widespread damage. And in fact, um, you know, the largest flood on record was the flood of, of 1862, um, which bankrupt the state of California, it forced the state government to leave Sacramento and move to San Francisco. Um, something like one third of all taxable properties in the state of California were, were damaged. So this was a very serious flood in 1862. And, and, and Southern California has had a history of these episodic floods that are serious, that intense rainfall, um, for prolonged periods of time, mud and debris coming off the mountains all around it, clogging up infrastructure. And um, Southern California was trying to grow. It was trying to grow a strong economy um, and, and, and had this problem with these floods that would over, overtop the channels year after year and um, cause these types of problems around the region. So. Um, this photograph here is one that I thought was especially interesting. It's a, it's a photograph of Venice Beach showing how the, the flood water, you know, and flooding problems with sediment and, and mud and muddy water made their way all the way down towards the coast. Um, so it was a widespread problem extending from, from the inland uh, up against the mountains down towards the coastline. And so then we basically uh, responded by building really monumental flood infrastructure across Southern California. And beautiful, you know, are, you know I think beautiful um, structures as well. This is a photograph again by, by Kevin Brake that, um, that sort of caught my attention. I think this was the, the Sixth Street Bridge, I believe, which has now been rebuilt. It's like a new iconic modern bridge that, that, that's, in, um, that's in Los Angeles. But you can see that there's one bridge after another going down the Los Angeles River. But take a look at our design of the infrastructure. This is a river. <laughs> and we kind of designed our rivers coming out after, this is in, in, you know, coming out after 38, got after World War II. We, and the Army Corps of Engineers led us in designing 
our rivers. And it looks like a military facility, doesn't it? It looks like sort of a fortress. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the technology at the time. It was like we were see seeing such damaging floods, you know, communities disrupted. They wanted something really strong that would protect the community from, from these damaging floods. And it was a time we didn't understand you know, all the different ecological aspects of the river and all the different ecosystem services that a river provided. And so we designed around the one thing that was creating a lot of problem, which was this severe flooding. And so we came up with this fortress-like design. And you can see as the water comes, it's, it's fast moving water. This isn't like a gently moving stream. This, the Los Angeles River drops more in elevation from Glendale to Long Beach than the Mississippi River drops from Minnesota to Louisiana. But it's, it's um, and it sets up these beautiful flow regimes in the river, these wakes, these waves. Um, another, another theme I think about when I look at these, these flows is that, um, you know, around, around after World War II, we were starting to develop supersonic aircraft um, here in Southern California. And these rivers were designed for what we call supercritical flow. If we, if we let the water flow shallow and fast, we could get away with a smaller channel, right? We don't need as much space if the, if the river is small and compact and we promote supercritical flow. We can actually move water to the ocean with a really compact footprint and, um, and with a flow that is fast and, and shallow. And that's what we got um, with these designs. But some of the other things we got were um, divided communities. <laughs> you know, um, we had infrastructure that didn't offer any shade. You know, when California is facing more and more heat waves and we have rivers that offer no shade um, without any trees, um, we live in an area that's got severe problems with water scarcity and the rivers aren't designed to conserve water. They're not designed to facilitate groundwater recharge the way a natural stream would. Um, and we're not, they're not designed to deliver sediment to the coast. We designed all of our rivers and all of our dams in Southern California to trap sediment at the up in the mountains. And, um, and what that's done now is it's starved our coastline of sand and sediment that we need to respond now that sea level is rising at a faster and faster rate um, and um, stressing our beaches. So our infrastructure decisions that we made after World War II now are you know, imp have implications for our coastal flood risk. And then I'll also point out that we have vast communities you know, built out in lowland areas um, closer to the coast um, that are sort of, you know, that are basically vulnerable to, um, to infrastructure failures. So these, these are all communities where the housing and grade of the properties are all lower than the, um, than the, than the levees. So if water were to kind of overtop or break through, then downhill um, with all, this, all these properties sit in low topography. So let's take a look now at sort of Southern California as a flood risk vulnerable area. I've got a map here where all the gray areas are areas that are urbanized. So we've got something on the order of 19 million people living in the LA metro region in these, mainly in these urbanized areas. The purple areas are areas that are considered disadvantaged communities. So these are communities that are more vulnerable to climate extremes and to climate impacts and flooding in particular. Um, and then around our urban areas, these hatched areas are something we call the wildland urban interface. And this is a, a mapping of the wildland urban interface done by a colleague of mine, Tirtha Banerjee at UCI, who's been using remote sensing data to try to figure out what are, where exactly is this interface between the wildlands and the urban areas. So this, is a, this is a newly developed wildland urban interface based on remote sensing data. But we, so we have this, low, this coastal plain surrounded by mountains, and broadly the flood risk relates to storm systems coming in off the ocean with a lot of rainfall striking the mountains, striking all of this urbanized area and water trying to run off really quickly to the coast. That's essentially the flood risk that the region faces. But there's some twists now that we're trying to kind of get a handle on. One is that the mountains are increasingly, you know, going through cycles of wildfire. And after a fire, 
the hill slopes are exposed. So you see rainfall starting to produce um, you know, large amounts of sediment moving down into our infrastructure. So that we have these, um, these, what are called debris basins. All around these mountains, these debris basins are set up to capture the sediment and the mud that runs off of the mountains so that we don't um, clog our infrastructure and, and lose capacity against flooding. But that's, you know, but it we lose the capacity all the time. This is a photograph of a culvert that's clogged with sediment after a fire. And, and um, also throughout the, throughout the, um, the region, our, 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 our main stem flood channels are um, sometimes filling with sediment and filling with vegetation. So we may have designed this channel to be this sleek, supercritical flow like I showed you earlier. But then we've also said, well, we care about you know, ecosystems and we'd like to have some vegetation. And we sort of taken, in some areas, we've taken another direction with our channels, um, which has some value, but it also reduces the capacity of those channels and they're no longer able to offer the flood protection that they previously um, had when they were first designed. So we, so we, so we have this environment now of, of um, um, 19 million people and the third largest metropolitan economy on the planet. So vulnerable to these, one of these big severe floods. And um, when we look at the areas that have been mapped by the Army Corps engineers to be vulnerable to, I'm not Army Corps, but the FEMA mapping, um, areas that have been mapped um, as being falling within a 100-year flood zone, those areas are actually quite small. There's, there's some over here, there's a few little spots where the 100-year flood zone is this dark purple. So there's a little bit along the coast. This is in Orange County. Um, but there's very little dark purple in Orange County. <laughs> I mean, in, in Los Angeles County here. Um, which is interesting because at the same time that the, that the um, recent studies by, a recent study by the Army Corps of Engineers studied this segment of the Los Angeles River and concluded that it was undersized to contain a 100-year event. So they did a special study of this river segment and it was undersized. Um, Los Angeles County Department of Public Works did a study of these channels and decided that they were undersized to contain a 100-year event. Yet, none of the maps are updated to say that people are at risk. Um, and so, and so um, based on the current FEMA mapping, there's, we estimate there's probably around 23,000 people falling within their 100-year flood zone in Los Angeles County, 23,000. And um, so, so we want to get at what's, how many people are really at risk and who is at risk and what can we do about it? These are kind of the questions. So we built out a, a fine resolution flood hazard model. This is the software that was developed at, at UCI and my group. Um, we tried to simulate what we call compound flooding, which means the possibility of flooding from the coast or from the rainfall, from stream flow. Um, we wanted to estimate flood exposure um, across the county. And we did that by intersecting census data with our flooding data. Um, we wanted to estimate when, with, for areas that are at risk of flooding, you know, who's at risk of flooding and are these areas that are especially vulnerable? Um, and we also wanted to, to ask, you know, um, how is the flooders distributed across the municipalities of the region? And so cities and counties, cities at the city level, they'll have a better awareness of what's happening in their, in their community and things that they can do to take action. So you might ask, well, why wasn't this done before? <laughs> and the reason why is because there's massive data bottlenecks trying to take these detailed models of flooding and try to span them out over a city the size of Los Angeles and the LA metro region. Um, um, so we're, we're, in order, we, what we've decided as an engineering field is in order to do this type of modeling well, we need to do it with detail at fine resolution. We need to account for the drainage pipes. We need to account for the culverts. But when we start doing that at each community, it becomes so data intensive that we can't scale up to an entire region. So we're stuck with like lots of little local studies that aren't really interconnected and don't provide the big picture of what's happening. So we developed this new, me new method which overcame some of those challenges. And one of the things we did to do that, just to give you a sense of the appreciation of the data, is we, we um, started with an aerial LIDAR survey, which is a laser scanner that flies over the, over, the, over the region, scans the ground, and maps out the topography of the ground. And the topography of the ground is the most important thing to do flood simulation. You need to know, is it sloping this way? Is it sloping that way? Where's water going to channel? How's it going to flow? 
So topography data is extremely important. But I want you to imagine, if you're an, if you're an airplane flying over Los Angeles, what are you going to see when you look down? Are you going to see drain, all the drainage pathways? Over here, you're going to see a freeway. If, you, if, I, if you're in an airplane with a laser scanning downwards, you're going to see the top of the freeway. You won't necessarily see the fact that there's an underpass that where water can flow underneath the freeway. Right? So there's a limitation there. This is not far from us. This is the intersection of the 73 freeway and the 55 freeway, which you may have come down on your way here today. And there is a drainage pathway that goes here. This is a channel, a drainage channel. And then it goes underneath this freeway complex, and it pops out over here. So if we're just relying on this detailed aerial LIDAR data, then we're not, we're gonna have, we're not gonna know some of these flow pathways. So we went ahead and, and accessed all of the drainage network that's available from Los Angeles County and from Orange County, and we made sure we sort of burned channels into our data set and counted for those pathways before we did our modeling. So that's kind of the main point I wanted to make and on that front. And then when we did that, this is our estimate of the sort of flood, 100-year flood depth across the LA um, Orange County coastal plain. And this is sort of a, a graphic that my um, colleague Jochen Schubert put together. We, we sort of um, went for a little bit of an artistic direction here, just trying to create something that, that captured the spatial extent of the, of the flooding and the changes in resolution. And you can really see, like, even though we've built out this whole coastal area with tons of streets and housing and everything else, you can still see the ancient sort of natural flow pathways across the land surface, right? You can still see where the lowlands were. and where, So ground didn't change that much after we built it. Some of those same lowland areas are still there today. And that also explains what we'll come to later, which is the massive exposure that we found in our study. That once we, we simulated, we also found, just like the Army Corps of Engineers and just like Los Angeles Department of Public Works, that some of these channels were unable to contain these, this 100-year event. Well, what happens if the channel water spills out over the sides of this channel that runs across the land surface and it collects in low areas? The low area of this region extends from here, sort of down, down into Long Beach. And this was historically... Um, areas that were sort of riparian wetlands. The San Gabriel River and the Los Angeles River would have wound through here, and I'm taking different pathways to the coast, and it was a wetland area, lowland topography, and so that's where water collects, you know, during a, during a big extreme event um, in our simulation, and it's where it collected historically. We get, in our modeling, we broke this down by different hazard drivers. We looked at the number of people exposed to rainfall flooding, which was, you know, 247,000 people. Um, that alone compared to the FEMA estimate of, say, 23,000, you can see that it's more than an order of magnitude different in terms of the number of people exposed. Um, the fluvial flooding, whoops. Um, the fluvial flooding here, you can see is the river flooding is right along the rivers. This is like flooding associated with, with basically channels that are undersized to contain the flow rate. And then coastal flooding is actually um, Presently, coastal flooding is exposing far fewer people than either pluvial or, or fluvial. So I want to teach you a new tool. Some, so when you go home today, you can say, I learned something new. I think it's new. It was new to me. Just, a, just in the last two years is something I learned. It's called the Lorenz curve, or Loren, Lorenz curve. And it's a tool from economics. Okay? So it's a tool from economics that's meant to help us measure equity. So what, what the Lorenz curve does is we can sort of use this, this room as an example, okay? All of us have a certain amount of wealth, okay? Imagine all of us sort of basically being sorted, where everybody over on one side has the most wealth, and then on the left-hand side is the person with the least wealth. Okay, so you can imagine sorting everyone by how much wealth you have, okay? So if you're on the least wealth side, you would be over on this side of the, the, the curve. If you have the most wealth, you would have been sorted on this side of the curve. And next thing we do is we keep track of the, cum the cumulative amount of wealth across all of us. 
So with this curve here, what we're plotting is the proportion of the population. We start on the left-hand side, work our way to the right-hand side, we've accounted for everybody. But as we work our way across, we start encountering people that have more and more wealth. So as we, as we see that happen, we start ramping up with our curve, okay? So the curve starts off with a low slope because the people on the left-hand side have relatively small amounts of wealth, and, and it ramps up on the right-hand side because people have more wealth. So this is called the Lorenz curve. Its proportion of the population is the x-axis. Proportion of the wealth is the y-axis. And once we create this, we can compare it to something called the line of equity. So in an equitable world, wealth is evenly distributed. Okay? That's the basic idea. How, how different from equitable is your distribution? That's kind of what we try to measure. And we measure that by this area between the two curves. And we give it a number called the Gini coefficient. So what we can do then is study how this sort of Gini coefficient varies for different you know, factors. And another thing we can do is we can say, well, if we went to the midpoint, where half the people on the right-hand side are the upper half of the distribution, and then we got the lower half of the distribution, we can ask, well, what's the, what's the break point there? And what that tells us is that basically 18% of the wealth is with the lower half of the population. And 72% of the wealth, according to this curve, is with the upper half of the population. So that's another way you can kind of use this Gini coefficient to draw, to infer something about some quantitative measure of the inequity, okay? So we did the same thing, but with risks. How are the risks distributed? Are they distributed evenly about across everybody? Or are they somehow um, inequitably distributed? And so we can have the same type of um, curve where the, instead, of, instead of being proportion of the wealth, we now have the proportion of the risk. And, um, and we can sort, I sorted, in my example, I sorted everyone by how much wealth you have. We can also sort by other factors. We can go neighborhood by neighborhood and sort by What's the socioeconomic status of that neighborhood? What's the property value of that neighborhood? How many people in that neighborhood are black? How many people in that neighborhood are Hispanic? So we can use all these different sorting variables and then test which of these sorting variables tell us something about, um, or sort of indicate some sort of inequities, and which ones are equitable. So, um, so, we, so we can do that and we end up having like some disproportionate exposure. That's one of the main takeaways. We can also have disproportionate underexposure. Okay, so that would mean that that particular variable points to a group or an indicator that points to less than, than equitable um, exposure. So just a summary of the Gini coefficient, you ex expect it to vary from minus one to one. If it's zero, it implies a proportional exposure across the population. Um, positive values um, suggest disproportionate um, exposure for higher values of the sorting variables. So uh, one example we'll see, for example, is that um, communities with higher fractions of black populations had higher levels of exposure. So that's one of the inequities that we identified in our study. And negative values suggested less than inequitable exposure for that sorting variable. So these are the different sorting variables that um, we looked at in our study. Um, we had socioeconomic variables like um, property value, neighborhood disadvantage, something called the social vulnerability index. And we had racial and ethnic variables, like the fraction of the population that was black, the fraction of the population that's Hispanic, white, and Asian. Um, and you can see what those distributions are. So we'll start here with the racial and ethnic equity analysis. Each one of these curves is a Lorenz curve based on, um, on, the, on the horizontal axis. We have the sorting variables being the um, black, black population fraction, the Hispanic population fraction, the Asian population fraction, and the white population fraction. On the vertical axis, we have different types of flooding. Coastal flooding, river flooding, street flooding, okay? And then we have the overall flooding on top. So the first thing you can point that we saw here was that black communities were disproportionately exposed to river flooding. So you can see that, that, that Lorenz curve dips downwards it's got a Gini coefficient of 0.5, which is a pretty large Gini coefficient. And why that is is somewhat gleaned from this graphic here. This is our fluvial flood zone. And you can see that there are you know, black communities living sort of really close to this deep 
flood zone. So that's the congruency between the, the, the sort of segments of the, the geography of Southern California where there's large um, population, large black um, populations and alignment with that fluvial flood risk. Another inequality that we saw here was the Hispanic. So Hispanic was also sort of a reasonably sort of moderate indicator from a, a, um, um, of a disproportionate exposure to, to river flooding. And another one that's obvious here is the white um, exposure. So in the white communities are disproportionately less exposed to, to river flooding in Los Angeles County. Um, but uh, if you look at coastal flooding, then here, there's a really um, strong association with white communities and coastal flooding. Um, so we also looked at the sort of socioeconomic perspective, you know, the sort of inequities and in exposure, and something new that was introduced as part of our research project was something called the Neighborhood Disadvantage Index. And this was an index developed by uh, my colleague David Brady at UC Riverside. He's a sociologist. And it was developed from literature on neighborhood disadvantage, urban and concentrated poverty, neighborhood effects, and residential segregation. So he went into census data and more specifically something called the American Community Survey, which is done more frequently and gets more, you know, more detailed questions about so the, the breakup and the makeup of a community. And he looked at variables like economic resources, social policy, housing, labor market, and demographics. And all these were put into an index which offers a non-racial indicator of socioeconomic disadvantage. So what, one of the things that was different in David's, um, David's indicator is that it was meant to be strictly an indicator of socioeconomic sort of capacity and not necessarily an indicator of skin color. And other vulnerability indicators had been heavily weighted by, by, um, by sort of um, racial and ethnic indicators. So when we looked at socioeconomic inequalities, we saw something that wasn't nearly as strong as the, uh, as the sort of racial and ethnic inequalities. So um, fluvial hazards, there was a, a strong association. I guess that's someone, I'm just contradicting myself now. But um, in, in, with um, fluvial hazard, there is a, a, a pretty, pretty, um, pretty strong um, association between the neighborhood disadvantage and fluvial flood risk. So it showed that more disadvantaged communities are disproportionately exposed to flooding. Um, but this is the one that was on my mind when I made that comment just a moment ago, which is that if you look at something like property value, property value is equitably exposed to flood risk in Southern California. <laughs> Everybody's got property at risk, no matter if it's expensive property or poor property, it's somehow equitably exposed to flood risk. Um, and another one is that um, the, the sort of along the coast, those, the, the, the properties along the coast that, or the communities along the coast um, are disproportionately, that are exposed are more affluent communities. So, um, so basically maybe a, a takeaway here is that, is that um, from a socioeconomic perspective, disadvantaged communities are more exposed to that fluvial flood risk. White communities and more affluent communities are more exposed to the coastal flood risk. Property is, is um, sort of equitably exposed exposed across the region. You can see it's a tongue twister to somehow say that over and over again. Um, okay, next point here is that we wanted to turn this data set into like a tool that's useful for local government, county government to take action. And, um, and a lot of the proactive sort of decision making to address flooding starts at local government. And local governments work through their flood control districts, they work through their county governments, they work through their state governments, and then federal governments to try to bring resources into their communities to either for mitigation projects or after floods happen to bring resources in to help with recovery or to help with vulnerability reduction measures. And so being able to take this detailed flood hazard data, aggregate it at the community level, and then compare some of these communities side by side allows us to kind of um, identify those communities in the region that are, are really high priorities for, for assistance. So on the left-hand side is a, is a sort of a plot of, for every bubble is the number of people exposed to the 100-year flood zone within a um, municipal government. And, um, and on the right-hand side is where we take that same circle, the number of people exposed, and we plot it with on, an, on, on, on uh, 
in an XY plot where the Y axis corresponds to how severe the flooding is. So big circle up in Long Beach means that a lot of people are exposed to the 100-year flood zone in Long Beach. The fact that the circle is up high means that the average flood depth is high. It's comparable, to, you know, getting close to a meter, average flood depth for, for the region. The x-axis uh, represents the neighborhood disadvantage of those people who are exposed to flooding. So the question there is, is this an area where the population exposed to flooding is highly disadvantaged? Or is this an area where the population exposed to flooding is, more, um, is less disadvantaged? So on the right-hand side are the more disadvantaged communities. So like Bell Gardens is a community that would have really high disadvantage, a moderate flood risk. And, and, and what we've seen across the US is that these most disadvantaged communities don't even have staff or, or any resources to even ask for assistance. So, so, it's what, so basically a lot of the aid and assistance for flooding often flows back to more affluent communities, not necessarily because they, and not because it's not, they're not deserving, but because they've, they've written a proposal. And if you don't have resources to even have a staff, you can't even write a proposal to ask for assistance. And that's one of the problems we face today. So with a tool like this, you know, state and, and governments and, and regional governments can start seeing who's, who's in need of assistance and doesn't even have the, the resources to, to ask for help. Um, I'll also mention that our, our modeling um, can be used in a forecasting mode. So this is a, a forecast of, um, a sort of retrospective forecast of Hurricane Harvey, so just showing how, you know, hour by hour the, the, the sort of flooding um, changes, and um, this potentially could be used as a forecasting tool to identify what's going to happen over the next five days as a storm rolls in, who's going to be exposed, how do we get assistance where it needs to be, how do we help communities take steps to be safe. So I'm wrapping up with a few slides. So what have we learned? Um, I think the first, the first big takeaway is that this advances in fine resolution modeling allows us to assess flood exposure and inequities um, across entire megacities. This is something new we haven't been able to do before. And when we do that, we see that cities are exposed actually a factor of 10 more than what might have been suggested by previously published federal maps. Um, we see that inequities in flooding are, are differ by, by hazard driver and across race, race and ethnicity. Um, they're different for property value, for disadvantage, for vulnerability. Um, so inequities are complex. You know, there's different, different equities um, depending on which, how you look at it. Um, we also point out that once we have these detailed models, we can aggregate them to a, a municipal level and try to support um, you know, allocation of resources and, and, and help, help, um, help governments with sort of mitigation and, and um, preparedness and recovery and assistance. So how does this sort of align with previous work? What it, um, first of all, it really confirms that flood risks are underreported due to one, the pluvial contribution. One thing I did not mention earlier is that by rule, FEMA was not required and still not required to map areas at risk of rainfall flooding that rainfall pluvial flooding is not required to be mapped by rule. So, so certainly once we account for that, we see much larger exposures. Than, um, but secondly, I think a lot of the previous modeling is not accounting for the fact that our infrastructure is aging, it's getting clogged with vegetation and sediment, and, um, and that's contributing also to the, ca the capacity being reduced. Um, Previous national modeling suggested that, so nationwide modeling that was somewhat coarse, suggested that you know, um, some, of the, some of the biggest inequities in, across the US in terms of exposure was that poor, more white communities were disproportionately exposed to flooding across the United States. And that's, previous, that's basically coming from the fact that we know the southeastern part of the US is exposed to big hurricanes, um, and a lot of people are exposed to flooding. But what this work shows is that if you look in cities, and you map city risk really carefully, you start seeing that there are other racial groups that may be exposed to flooding. And so you start seeing the opposite of what's been concluded based on national studies. Um, and I guess the last point here is at a time of sort of heightened awareness about climate change, this work illuminates the importance of land use change and aging infrastructure on flood risks. 
So, so kind of moving forward here, um, I guess the takeaway points are, you know, our flood infrastructure is aging and, and needs investments. Um, and the demands on infrastructure performance are growing. Uh, in the past, we built our infrastructure to protect communities, provide this safety that allowed us to develop. But now we want much more out of infrastructure. We want infrastructure that conserves water, that provides ecosystem benefits, that makes cities more livable, that improves water quality, helps with sediment delivery to the coast, many different things. And so the, the demands on design are, are, are heightened and, and we can do a better job of meeting those needs. Um, we, can, we, can, we can think seriously about how do we meet all those different needs. This, and I think these simulation technologies offer a platform you know, could, to sort of allow stakeholders across regions to, to work together, to think about what do we want? Was, we could test the inequities of different, and effectiveness of different interventions with a model like this one and figure out, you know, what's gonna uh, offer the best effectiveness and, and, and reasonable trade-offs of different benefits. So, um, so I close with my little Bob Dylan line, um, come in, she said, I'll give you shelter from the storm. Thank you.